Good afternoon. This week we're going to be covering the subject of white collar and organized crime. And we will be watching one movie which covers white collar crime, and one aspect of white collar crime, and discussing that uh, in class. And the movie I usually use is someone, it's one that's not well known to a lot of people. It's called Boiler Room, uh, as opposed to using something like Wall Street or The Wolf of Wall Street. There's several movies that go into investment and investment fraud type of thing. Uh, the Boiler Room is lesser known, but it's pretty good. So I use that one instead because it's the likelihood of someone having seen it before is pretty small. So let's get into it. So White Collar Crime, you remember that guy Edwin Sutherland, who talked about differential association, how people learn about crime, how people learn from the people that they're around and commit crimes because of that. Well, Sutherland also defined white-collar crime. <clears throat> and at the time when he described it, and he actually wrote an entire book on it, uh, that violations of the criminal law committed by a person of respectability and high social status in the course of one's occupation, that was white-collar crime. You see, I'm wearing a blue collar today. Now think about white collar if you've ever seen the movie Mad Men. And people that were higher up in the corporate ladder generally wore white shirts and ties. You know, their suit with their white shirt and tie. And that was the uniform of the high social status and respectability. Now, of course, we, we, we wear different colors, uh, but they still have you know, the suit and tie kind of thing is those people for the most part, as opposed to somebody who's, you know, say a construction worker or even a police officer or a teacher, somebody has a generally lower level, you know, they call those blue collar workers, if you will. Some in between might be called professionals, uh, but uh, the thing is, Sutherland defined white collar crime based upon the social, social status of the person, but today it's a little bit more different. And we don't generally use the same means to define white-collar crime that he did. And our criminals today are a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, people even at lower levels have opportunities to commit crimes that are very similar to what Sutherland defined. And so that, that definition has ex expanded quite a bit. Now... White-collar criminals less likely to be investigated, arrested, or prosecuted than other types of offenders, and mainly that is because their crimes aren't as obvious. Their crimes could be your investment banker who is skimming off the top of your investments and not, not telling you. It could be the soccer mom who's the treasurer, or somebody involved in, in your Boy Scout troop, or somebody involved in you know the local football team, or the PTA who is skimming money. It could be a secretary working in an office who has access to a lot of funds coming in and out. All of those would be considered white-collar crime. So, and with the use of computers, some of this stuff gets a lot easier as well. Insider training, trading is, you know, most of us are not, even me, not really involved in stocks and bonds and those kinds of things. You know, we hear about it there's commercials all the time for like TD Ameritrade and all these different companies, Scott and, and what have you. But there's trading of stocks and bonds on Wall Street and in the marketplace. And a problem called insider trading is when someone, say, finds out about a major change that's going to happen to some company. They know that, like, say, next week. General Motors is going to buy Toyota, or maybe the other, the reverse is true. And if you know that's going to happen, you could buy the stock for the company at the low price it is today, and then when the trade or the, the purchase gets announced, when the stocks jump, you make a lot of money. Or conversely, they say you hear that that a company is going to announce that they had major losses during the last quarter of their fiscal year. And you find that out ahead of time, so maybe you sell off your stock while it's still high because when they make their announcement it's going to drop 
significantly. That's insider trading. Bank fraud is fraud or embezzlement occurs within or against financial institutions. So, again, you have somebody who may be defrauding uh, with false bank accounts, who's embezzling money from the accounts that they have responsibility for. You know, take that lady. There was a lady a couple years ago who was working for an office uh, in, uh, I forget whether it's Montgomery or Delaware County, and she basically embezzled a whole lot of money out of the corporate accounts, set up accounts where she moved money to for herself, for her personal use, bought herself, you know, jewelry and got her nails done and her hair done and all kinds of stuff. And then when she found out that, that they were getting on to her, she decided to flee and called and said that she and her kid were kidnapped uh, and they were in the trunk of the car and there was this whole, you know, wow, these people were kidnapped and everybody was upset. And it turned out she went to Disney World. Obviously, she was ultimately captured and charged, but that would be a bank fraud situation and white-collar crime. So the definition, as you can tell, has evolved over time. Early definitions really looked at the person who was doing it. You know, somebody who was at a high level in an organization was a white-collar criminal no matter what they did. Today, we look more at what it is that they're doing as opposed to who's doing it. That's why it could be a secretary in an office who has access to accounts could be considered a white-collar criminal even though she's making, like, almost no money. But it's So it's not, the, it's not necessarily the person but the, the crime. And there's been a variety of definitions of, of these types of crimes over the years. All right, Herbert Edelhertz... So you can see his definition, any illegal act or series of illegal acts committed by non-physical means, by concealment or guile to obtain money or property to avoid payment or loss. Basically, we're talking about what most of us would call fraud. And by, when well, they say non-physical means, means I'm not going out and I'm not robbing somebody at gunpoint, I'm not strong-arming them. I am using my brain and my access to, to rip people off. Matter of fact, there was a, a announcement just a few weeks ago, uh, and if you look up the largest bank robbery in history, it's actually a cyber crime, where somebody used their brain and their computer skills, and that might fall into white collar crime, because it wasn't like they went into the bank and robbed it. They used their computer, they moved money around, and they stole a lot of stuff. Gilbert Geis, he used the term upper world crime. Again. He was talking about people who were ab above the so-called underworld. You know, we're going to talk about uh, the uh, the mob and organized crime later on. That's generally called the underworld. Well, this is the upper world. Blue collar crime. Again, those people who are in a lower level jobs who might take advantage and. You know, steal stuff, say, if I'm a construction worker and I'm stealing supplies from the construction site and taking them home to work on my house, that might be considered a blue-collar crime. Or, let's say I'm a teacher and I get a, uh, a uh, stipend for supplies and I buy all kinds of supplies and then I take them home and I sell them at the flea market or something. All right, Occupational crime, another similar type of thing. So somebody has an opportunity that's created during the course of their legal occupation like some of the examples we already gave that would be considered occupational crime so there's different definitions for basically the same thing organizational occupational crime so you have crime that's committed for the benefit of the organization so say uh, an organization like uh, let's say a trash company is dumping their trash somewhere other than the dump that they got to pay a lot of money for. Now, later on, we're going to see this might also be an environmental crime, but the organization is, is defrauding the community or doing things that, that are saving their money or making their money. State authority occupational crime is when you have somebody who is part of the state government or the federal government who is committing crimes that uh, are part of their authority. You know, we had the investigation of Hillary Clinton's emails 
would be falling in that category. Guys like Vince Fumo, uh, recently uh, released from prison after having been prosecuted for committing crimes while in office. Uh, Chaka Fatah, who is about to go to trial in the spring for uh, crimes that are alleged to have occurred and based upon his authority as a, as a congressman. Professional occupational crime is people who, like say doctors, lawyers, others who are professionals who commit crimes in their capacity as professionals. Uh, one recent case, there's a lawyer over here in South Jersey in Marlton who was helping elderly people with their investments. Example I already gave. But this would it would fall in here because he was a lawyer and people were uh, consulting with him, getting help from him, and he was basically taking their money and putting it in an account for himself and then creating false statements, you know, somehow defrauding all these people. Individual occupational crime is the guy who's the, the average Joe who is part of his job is making money for himself and ripping people off, whether it be ripping his company off or ripping off the customers. Let's say I sell windows. My dad actually works for Home Depot and he goes out and he signs up contracts for windows. Let's say if he told people, well, I need a $200 cash deposit on every sale and that money never went to Home Depot. It went in his pocket. That would be individual occupational crime. Corporate crime, similar to what we already talked about as the uh, organizational occupational crime. Corporate crime is uh, the more recent definition that's used. So you have a company or somebody who's in charge of the company who is violating criminal laws, benefiting themselves or the company. Uh, there are plenty of examples of that going on and you see violations of environmental laws, you see violations of uh, antitrust laws, violation of investment laws, uh, a whole variety of things that have been talked about in recent years. And sometimes you have the government charging the company and then the company having to pay fines. And one of the arguments today is you have these people in charge of the company who are making these decisions and shouldn't they be charged as well? One of the biggest uh, types of corporate crime in history years ago was the case, the Enron case. If you look it up, you'll hear all about it. Enron, there's also a book about it called The Smartest Guys in the Room. You had top executives in this, this co company in, in Texas called Enron. They were involved in all kinds of uh, utilities. They were involved in oil. They were a lot involved in electricity. They were involved in gas and they were were buying and selling on the marketplace all these things but there was a lot of fraud involved and some of this stuff that they were buying and selling didn't even exist and it was like a house of cards and when when it was eventually found out this company failed tremendously and unfortunately a lot of innocent people who were people who were part of the company lost their jobs a lot of people who invested in this company lost a lot of money. That was corporate crime. And in that case, those guys were definitely uh, charged. One of the guys was named Skilling. Uh, the other one, uh, his name I, I, I don't recall at the moment, but very, very familiar back when that happened. Environmental crimes, mentioned that already. So you have a company or an individual who commit crimes against the environment, crimes that are going to be damaged, damaging the environment, uh, protected or otherwise significant aspect of the environment. You have the examples they have here, whaling or intentional pr pollution. So say you have some type of animal, whether it be a whale or, or some type of bird or whatever, that has been protected by federal law and someone goes out and captures or kills, like the bald eagle, our national symbol. If someone were to go out, that technically that would be an environmental crime. But probably a better example and a more common example are people that are dumping things. Uh, if you talk about a really low level, those of you that live in the city or have been through the city, you look at you know some of the vacant lots, and we've talked about vacant lots with regard to broken windows theory and other theories. 
the vacant lots that where people dump stuff, dump their trash. Technically, that's an environmental crime. Let's say you have someone who pumps out septic systems. I don't know if anyone here has a septic system, but basically, for those that don't know, instead of having you know a, a city sewer system where when you go do your business, it goes into the pipes and it goes off to the, the sewer plant and gets cleaned up, some people have what they call a septic system because they're too far away from the pipes. And so you have what they call sludge. You know, all your business goes into this field in, in behind your house or a tank behind your house or in front of your house, wherever it might be. And every once in a while, you have to have the truck come and pump it out. Well, let's say the guy who pumps out the truck, he's got to take it to somebody else that he's got to pay money to to get rid of it. Well, maybe he can't afford it or he wants to save money He's going to go and dump it somewhere. Let's say he dumps it in an open field out in the Pine Barrens, or he dumps it in an open field uh, in North Philly. Wherever he dumps it, that's an environmental crime. Uh, there was a, a, a lot of uh, issues years ago with trash haulers who were who were taking their trash from cities like New York and, and Philadelphia and other places and dumping them out in the middle of nowhere. Environmental crimes. I actually just met a guy from the uh, used to work for the New Jersey Attorney General's office who maybe I can have him come into class at some point and talk to us whose job in the Attorney General's office was investigating these types of crimes so again going back to Sutherland and his he defined white collar crime but he also said that it's learned remember Sutherland was also responsible for the theory of differential association so he applied it to white collar crime and uh, we're going to talk about organized crime in a moment, but if you think of anybody seen the movie Goodfellas, differential association. These people are hanging out with each other. They're learning from each other. Their level of criminality increases based upon the environment that they're in. Well, white-collar crime is no different. You get it might get into a company if the corporate structure is such that we do these things, we do it this way. And you come in, and we're going to see... Actually, the movie Boiler Room is a perfect example of differential association. You're going to see this young man come into the company. He's going to think he's going to be a trader. He's going to think he's going to be a legitimate trader. He's going to be able to sell people uh, something that's going to help them to build their financial uh, war chest and, and make people's lives better. As it turns out, he walks into a hornet's nest and a place where it's built upon fraud and people are the the people that they're selling to are getting conned in a big way so big time white collar crime and differential association where you're learning the ways of crime through the people that you associate with on a regular basis Hershey and Godfredson we've heard those names before they came up with the general theory of crime Appri applying it to white collar crime they basically said that white-collar criminals are motivated by the same things that drive every other criminal. Their, their self-interest, their pursuit of pleasure, their avoidance of pain. Remember the pleasure-pain principles from, from our classical and neoclassical crime theories. And they say white-collar crime is fairly rare because in, in most employment, people are, are ready to conform and they want to be uh, conformist and not criminals. Braithwaite, he said white-collar criminals are motivated by a disparity between the goals and the limited opportunities through conventional business practices. Remember we talked before about goals and means and people who might see a different way, you know, what they were called the innovators. So you have somebody who's who goes into a corporate environment and there's pressure, pressure, pressure to meet these goals. And you have these numbers. You have to sell so many cars a week. You've got to get so, get so many contracts signed. Whatever it is, there's that, that, that pressure. And maybe people find ways to get around the normal means and, and go a different way. It also includes elements of strain theories, subcultural theories, labeling theories, and control theory. So go back in the prior chapters and refresh your memory on, on those things. 
So how do we get rid of white-collar crime? And you see the federal government over the years, going back as far as 1890, has passed a whole lot of different laws to try to control various aspects of the financial environment. Uh, look at the Securities Exchange Act. You've heard of the, Security, the SEC, Securities Exchange Commission. Uh, you'll hear about that in, in, in Boiler Room. The SEC is responsible to oversee Wall Street and oversee all these companies that do trading. And there's been a variety of, of you can see, a variety of other laws, whether the Securities Act, the Clayton Act, Sherman Act, Sarbanes-Oxley, all of these were designed to deal with, with these types of issues. Coleman looked at four areas that we needed to reform the environment in which these crimes occurred so that they didn't occur. We need to increase the level of ethics that go on within these companies. We need to increase enforcement. And as you probably all well know, enforcement might be a problem today. Because what is is the biggest focus of a comp- an organization like the FBI who would normally be investigating these crimes? It's terrorism. Uh, you also have structure. Changing the structure in which these people operate. And the political environment. Changing the political environment. Maybe passing uh, new laws to, uh, to fight this. So that's the white collar crime aspect. And hopefully you'll be able to see the connections in the movie that I'm going to show you so you have a, a really good idea of how uh, these things do occur because like I said differential association all the different things that we talk about here within white collar crime are pretty much in that movie boiler room so let's move on to organized crime organized crime as again I mentioned the movie Goodfellas Goodfellas if you haven't seen it is, is an excellent movie and it's based on reality it's based on the story of a guy named Henry Hill who was a low-level member of of a crime family. He was not a made uh, mafia member because he wasn't full-blooded Italian or Sicilian. But the movie Goodfellas gives you a really awesome look at what the low-level members of of these crime families do on a day-to-day basis. And then, of course, you want to look at a high-level one. There's there's several ones out there that, you know, the fictional things like The Godfather. The Godfather shows you, you know, the interaction between the uh, the major crime families and, and the Godfathers, if you will. Fiction. But some pieces of it are, are fairly close to reality. And there are, obviously, on some of the, uh, the uh, networks that show a lot of crime shows, uh, there are, and I'm going to show you one episode with regard to organized crime, a lot of documentaries that go through the real organized crime family. So if you haven't seen them, uh, I'm going to tell you about some of them in class this week, uh, but they're really, really interesting. I particularly like the ones about the Philadelphia mob and, and all the things that have happened over the years as I've grown up and heard about these as, these things as as a young uh, a teenager and then a young man and a police officer hearing about all these different things over the years it's it's incredibly interesting to me so what's organized crime you have a highly dis- organized disciplined association engaged in supplying illegal legal goods services gambling prostitution loan sharking narcotics and labor racketeering is it just the mafia a lot of times when people talk about organized crime they tend to focus on the mafia but it's not just that there are biker gangs, there are drug gangs, there are all kinds of different organizations that commit crimes. And again, of course, one of those is is the Italian organized crime, which is the one that seems to have the most roots in our society, uh, actually came over from, from Italy, uh, organized here in the United States. You'll hear, I think if you watch... Uh, Godfather 2, you actually get some sense of the so-called black hand. Uh, The mafia has its roots in Sicily. La Cosa Nostra, as I mentioned in the movie Goodfellas, uh, the guys who are focused mostly in the movie cannot become uh, made members of the mafia because you have to be Italian. So there's ethnic succession where you have one immigrant or ethnic group succeeds another through assumption of a particular position in society. 
So you had in some, so talk about the zone of transition, you have people moving into one area, establishing themselves, and maybe one ethnic group establish themselves, and they move up, they become more powerful, and maybe some other ones come in. Uh, in New York, you had Jewish and Italian criminal groups flourishing uh, in New York City prior to the arrival of the Italian Mafia. And organized crime in the United States largely been the domain of Italian Americans for the last half century, but even though the focus has been mainly on Italian Americans, there have been, uh, you could probably look at, at any ethnic group and you're going to find that there are criminal elements and organized crim, uh, criminal groups within those uh, ethnicities. Uh, one of the issues with organized crime is the control of, of government officials. During Prohibition, Al Capone talk about uh, major interruption of law enforcement because there were a lot of people that were uh, on the payroll of of the organized criminals. So you had a lot of issues there where the laws were being ignored by the local police, say in Chicago, because they were on the payroll. So there's there is a, a history of corruption an association with uh, organized crime between law enforcement, government officials, and it still exists to this day. And we occasionally root it out, but it's still there. There's again, we go to the examples, Al Capone, uh, these organized crime leaders, they tried to consolidate power during Prohibition, uh, fighting with each other, killing each other, but that activity kind of went underground and quiet after 1931. Prior to that, they were really out in the open. There's been, obviously, the government's done a lot of things over the years to try to combat organized crime. One of those was the Kefauver Committee, which studied organized crime and basically told us that a nationwide crime syndicate, the Mafia, exists. If you watch, I forget whether it's Godfather 2 or 3, there are hearings and it, very similar to this. Uh, you think about in the early 60s when uh, Jack Kennedy was president, Bobby Kennedy was the attorney general. He fought hard against organized crime. Prior to him becoming the attorney general, he was uh, a staff attorney for, for one of the senators who was involved in uh, hearings with organized crime. So the Kefauver Committee studied this a great deal and they came up with these these four things what's the organization of organized crime and and in the mafia or the in, that's what everybody bases it on but other organizations use a similar structure it's more like a corporate structure if you remember from your intro to criminal justice course you were asked to to take a look at organized crime and also look at a, a normal organization and compare and contrast you know, if you look at IBM or you look at Microsoft or you look at ITT or whatever, what's the difference between how that organization is structured and how a uh, organized crime organization is structured? Here you have a boss, the CEO, the underboss is the next person underneath. Uh, counselors or consigliaries is like they're, they're uh, people that, that give them advice. And then lieutenants and soldiers. Now, people who are not soldiers, who are below the soldiers, are like your Henry Hills, who are not members of the family. They are working for the soldiers. And this is a, a chart. The chart is also in your book, which shows you the connections of the various part of the organization. It also shows you, you know, what type of activities that they're involved in. See the two lists. Uh, legitimate industries and then illegal activities, because one of the things that uh, organized crime also does is you, you have involvement in legitimate industries but you might use them as fronts for your illegal activities at the same time. So what's the organization of La Cosa Nostra? Uh, five of the 24 families in the United States are actually out of New York. Now you remember in the 80s these organizations were, were struck very hard by the uh, Attorney General's office and the uh, the FBI. There was a, a great deal of investigation and prosecution, and uh, you don't hear as much about them today, but they're still out there. They're definitely still out there. 
some of the activities they're involved in, uh, racketeering, vice, you know, say prostitution and drugs, theft or fence rings, gangs, uh, and terrorism. The primary motivation is money. More activities, this is just a, a list of a lot of different things that organized criminal or, uh, criminals could be involved in. You know, you name it. Any kind of crime that you can think of, there may be some organized crime uh, connection, if you will. In the, in the Italian Mafia, they had this code of conduct called Omerta. Basically, we have silence and loyalty of the family members. You weren't allowed to talk. You know, it was it was the highest respect to the members of your family. If you know you were arrested for something, if you go and you take your time and you keep your mouth shut, when you come out, good things could happen to you. On the other hand, if you decide to become a witness for the government, bad things might happen. Maybe there's a contract on your life. And in the in the eighties and early nineties, a lot of guys flipped and violated this code. And uh, like I said, if some of those documentaries talk a great deal about them. Okay. Excuse my phone. You like that? I think it's my car guy calling to tell me my car is going to cost me lots and lots of money. All right. Some other some other organized groups. This is a list. Like I said, pretty much any any ethnicity that you can think of probably has. Uh, some criminal element, but these are are some of the larger ones that have been out there over the years. And of course, you also have your gangs, your motorcycle gangs. You know, there's all kinds of of uh, groups out there. Transnational organized crime is basically the fact that that organized crime is not just in this country. It's you have organized criminal groups that are operating across international boundaries across our, our outside of our country involved in, in finance around the world involved in, in a lot of things drug trafficking uh, human trafficking all kinds of different things now again federal government try to to deal with these issues through the law the Hobbs Act RICO which we hear about a lot uh, RICO has allowed us to prosecute the leaders of these criminal enterprises if we can link them to the activities that go on. Uh, asset forfeiture, being able to take away someone's house, someone's car, someone's boat because it was used in the crime. Money laundering is basically taking money that you've gotten through your illegal activities and laundering it through your uh, so-called legitimate businesses. So what are some policy issues, some things we need to be concerned about? To close out, uh, again, no matter when you're studying crime, you always want to come up with uh, ways to deal with it. It's great that we understand it, but what do we do to stop it or, or to slow it down? What is our strategy going to be? You know, I, just, I just watched a press conference with the President of the United States talking about terrorism and, and the strategy. And the president, our president's convinced that his strategy is, is just fine. But what is our strategy going to be? If we have to, we have to understand the criminal element and what they're doing. Uh, are we going to increase the resources available to law enforcement? Right now, there's a lot of a lot of uh, focus being placed on terrorism, but the FBI and the Department of Justice is still working cases uh, in organized crime. But are they working enough of those cases? Increase in law enforcement authority. Do we want to give more power to law enforcement? or uh, the prosecutors to go in and investigate you know do we want to make it easier for them to get wiretaps easier for them to, to do different things uh, of course we got to balance that with with the uh, bill of rights the fourth amendment specifically and due process you know we don't want to be violating those those things and have the supreme court throw out our cases because we overstepped our bounds uh, we want to make some policy issues or make legitimate opportunities more readily available so people don't decide to go into crime. But, you know, that's something that is an issue across the board, no matter what kind of crime you're talking about. Uh, decriminalization or legalization to decrease opportunity. Some people suggest that there's some things that that organized criminals do, like, say, being involved in prostitution, as an example, that if we legalized it, that would take away the organized criminal element. 
uh, certain types of drugs. If we legalized it, it would take away the organized criminal element. So there's a lot of debate about that. So like I said before, make sure you read the textbook, uh, this chapter. Make sure you're in class, obviously, on, on Friday because we're going to you know, watch and discuss, watch the movie and discuss, and also watch a short documentary on organized crime. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great afternoon.